Hey, strangers. Welcome to another episode of The Strange Sessions. I am Krista. With me is Kurt. And I just would like to announce that we are less than a week away from September. We are. It is almost <laughs> fall. It is almost fall. It felt very <laughs> fall-like this morning. It's kind of breezy and cool, a little dark and gloomy. I love it. Hey, before I forget, if you want to skip, <laughs> it's weird for me to do this. I love it. If you it. want to skip the titillating 20, uh, which has been getting a little longer than 20 minutes, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. in the show notes, I put down what time the actual topic discussion starts because a lot of people don't like to listen to Chris and I talk about the weather or what I ate at McDonald's <laughs> that morning or anything like or that. why he doesn't feel good today. <laughs> or why I don't feel good today or apologizing for the shoddy quality of hey, this episode. Hey, we do do a taste test though, so yes. that might be enjoyable. I'm yeah, just saying. Yeah. So it's in there. It's in the show notes. So just go to the topic start time. Yeah. Um, yeah, now I'm all thrown off because I never do I know. That. Whew. What do we do now? <laughs> oh, shout outs. Oh, yeah, shout outs. Shout outs to our newest strangers, and those are Christy Lynn, Amy Edwards, and I want to give a special personal shout out to the cashiers at Love's Truck Stop for giving me my coffee free again this morning. Oh, they gave tea free? It's so weird because nice. it's like three bucks. Like, I don't usually go there. I've been going to Quick Trip, but you Right across see- the street. Yeah. I don't like hanging out in the quick trip parking lot waiting for you to text me that you're oh, up. Why? And I, I just don't. Where Loves is it's a, tr- a much smaller Loves parking is lot. a truck stop. So yeah. people always, you know, so I generally go to Loves and then when you message me that you're up to come over, I drive over to Quick Trip, get my coffee, and then come back. Oh, that's so hilarious. I had just pulled I had just pulled into Loves and I got your message and I'm like, oh and I went I was in. up early. Yeah, I went in to get my coffee and I just got my coffee. I went to the bathroom and I went in and got my coffee and there were two girls. They must both work there and they were talking and they're like, just coffee today? And I'm like, yep. And they're like, just take it. Nice. And this is like the third time they've done that. So it's like... They must recognize you. Or or no, maybe they're fans of the strange sessions. You think they'd (laughs) say something though. Yeah, you think they would. But uh, I (laughs) usually go to to Quick Trip because it's cheaper. Mm. But now it seems like there's a percentage chance that I'll just get it for free. Right. So shout out to those girls because well, they were awesome. awesome. Yeah. Housekeeping? Um, we did. Oh, Brad, we did get your voicemail. <laughs> and we your will. strongly worded voicemail. Your strongly worded voicemail. I haven't heard it. And we will address our, our what? Ineptitude? Our scatterbrainness for because he, he sent suggested me a, he a sent topic, me a topic right? to talk about and i think a bunch of notes about it oh <laughs> how nice haven't gotten to it yet wow. so brad by we, the way brad i knew nothing about this so yeah. it's all on kurt so yeah um we will get to that later this season he just curted you i'm guessing brad. i think the second last episode of the season will be like end of the season mop up where we do whatever we haven't done yet that we need to do and then nice. that final episode Corey will come on so it's that'll like, probably be topics like Corey will probably pick a topic end of the season housekeeping oh my god am i supposed to be able to read this it's pretty small <sighs> okay so this is one of the cards from work kurt meta zoo I yeah, it's like a, it's like a Magic the Gathering card game, but it this has cryptids so tiny. in it. Oh my god, I'm wearing glasses and I can't even see this. Do you want me to read it? Yes. So it is. Kurt is going to be reading about the hide behind. We've talked about the hide we've behind. We've talked about in it. An episode. It's, I love there, this one. There is a. Oh, that was horrible. that was a horrible oh throw. God. There is a. Uh, <laughs> it's just cool. Like it's it's like a it's like a more fun version of Magic the Gathering, but it says, "Oh my god, that is small." I love uh, that you have the, to take your glasses off. The to read flavor, it. the flavor text, which magic cards have too, where it just has like a quote or something. The flavor text says, "When you're drinking in a forest, be wary of trees that sway a little too much." Ooh, yeah. Because we talked in that episode about how we think the hide behind was something made up by um, lumberjacks. Oh yeah, to keep people out of the woods, right? Yeah, when they were because because it's drank, dangerous. Yeah, there, there was a lot of drinking stuff. Yeah. But the hide behind playing or mad, Magic the Gathering knockoff, MetaZoo, <laughs> says you can only play hide behind by placing it behind an object in the arena. So I'm thinking you might have to have something on the table and then you have to like have it behind the okay. object. Upon moving the object or if hide behind is no longer behind an object, place hide behind into the graveyard. In combat, damage dealt by the hide behind is zero if the opposing caster or target is drinking a beverage at the time. Do you think there's a board that comes with no, this? It's no, it's like Magic the Gathering where everything's on the table in front of you. It's just like a card game where you flip, you tip could the card. Could you have a little graveyard if you wanted to? You like could. I could put up my Halloween decorations. I want so to take a I'm, picture. I'm super excited to try the new 
pack because I think these cars are super cool. Yeah, they are. Those two packs here. Do you want to take one of these home? Yes, I do. Okay. And then I'll bring it back next time and I'll talk about what... Let's try this again. Oh, Ooh. that was perfect. That got me right in the forehead. Oh, stop. Uh, do we have any... We, Brad's voicemail I've addressed. Um, I was going to say next episode we're not recording because no, we are. Krista's going to be gone, but we are doing the <laughs> we next episode. It is the one after. The one after that, we're going to just replay an old side session. Yeah, I'm going to be on vacay. It's Krista's anniversary, and she would rather celebrate her love <laughs> than do the podcast, apparently. Right. Priorities. So, <laughs> so, but we will be here for next episode. And with school starting, like, that's part of the reason why I feel like this episode's not that great is because I've been super distracted by stuff. So I think the next episode is going to be a Reddit stories, hey, which everybody seems to like I'm not going like to complain about that. I love that. Because that's just copy and paste for stuff me, so it's there. super easy. And a lot of talk in The Strangers this week about Mandela effects and mm-hmm. synchronicities, mm-hmm. which is so cool. Yeah. Like, the Mandela effect stuff is fun. Yeah. The Zatarans one really threw me off, though, because my dad used to, because he lived in Mississippi, and he would come mm. up here. He, like, lived in both places, but he'd always bring me boxes of the Zatarans, and I don't remember there ever being an eye. No, I should have It looks like Jim. Zatarans. Like, you totally. would have thought at some point I would have called it Zatarans, and I never did. And it is Zatarans, because I remember the commercials, yeah. and that's how so it's Yeah, so it's just, because it doesn't even look right. I think Stephanie or somebody said the same thing, too, that it just doesn't look right. No, it doesn't. So, but it's it's also one of those things that I don't feel super strongly about either way. But I should ask Jim how it's spelled because yeah. that was we lived off of the black beans and rice when we were younger because it's so cheap. Yeah, and good. We would just buy like some andouille sausage to yeah. put in it, and that was a meal. Yep. Do oh, we have anything so else? good. Um, I wanted to thank everybody who has ordered merchandise yes, in the last you, day. I we just have a, a selection of mugs and t-shirts left that I really want to move. Um, just kind of get them sold so that at the beginning of season eight, yes, your microphone is on. <laughs> <laughs> Dang it! At the beginning of season eight, or sometime in season eight, I would like to have all new merchandise, better, better quality. I mean, these the Toy and B t-shirts are amazing. We, I want to keep that. Oh, you want to? Yeah, yeah, I could get more of those made. Yes. So I'll work with, hopefully, work with my friend Mark, who made these T-shirts. His family owns a company that makes promotional items, so it's kind of perfect. Yeah. I want to do baseball hats. I want to do stickers, magnets, keychains, stuff like that. But like really good mugs that can actually go in the dishwasher. So note to everybody who ordered a mug: they're microwave safe. They are not dishwasher safe. They were handmade by a coworker and fellow stranger. So. Just be careful with them. Um, but yeah, thank you, everybody, who I was like, hey, I want to move this stuff. And I got so many comments from people wanting to buy stuff. So yep. this stuff will be, I'll be getting everything prepped for shipment tomorrow. And I'm going to send everything out on Monday. Yes. So thank you so much for yeah. everybody that Absolutely. bought some of our stuff. Should we jump in- into Matthew Thornton's letter? Sure. Oh, man. I just don't think we're going to be able to talk much about it because I think it's going to be another. But I want to take it home because I, I want to look at these. I think I need and... to be a genius. Well, take them all. There's a pile of them yeah. right there. I'll have them up. Again, I'll somebody... have them up on my wall with the yarn going from, you know, Does letter Does anyone to letter. have a dedicated? There's a subreddit dedicated to his letters. But is there a podcast dedicated to? I don't think so. That but... would be interesting. Yeah, it would be. But there is a subreddit dedicated to his letters. Okay, let me take a picture a terrible dark picture have you had any weirdness in your place since no i haven't that's too bad oh stop it (laughs) sorry i'm like talking away from the microphone that's super annoying i don't think we have any other of course he's got like um yeah don't tear the envelope because he's always oh right and i mean there's like constellations on the back yeah i'm having to do this very carefully I don't have so any other... do you think he sends like a ton of these out? Like yes. a bunch of people get yes. the same letter? I don't know if a bunch of people get the same letter, but I do think he sends a bunch of them out. I mean, he's hand drawn yeah. all this stuff on here. Yeah. It's just so funny that we had an episode talking about him and then we started getting the yeah. the letters. Oh, this is It's not nearly, oh, it's only like two pages. Normally there's like four or five pages in here. Oh, there's a lot of text in this one. Yeah, I want to take those home. Okay. Maybe take a picture of those and post them in the I'm group. I'm going to do it after. upstairs okay. where the light is good and where I can okay. spread them out. Okay. okay. Jump into the taste test. Yeah, let's do it. 
By so, the way, thank you, Matthew, for sending yes, us. Yes, thank you, Matthew, for thinking about us. I'm excited to check those Someday out. I'll figure out how to decipher all this. I don't think anybody knows, but I think <laughs> right. I think there's bits and pieces that people are getting, but I think that's it. Um, the taste test, this first taste test, I don't know if we're going to do a second one, was given to us by uh, faithful stranger David Bond. Yes. And he said... He gave me a bunch of things, and he said to test this one when we were doing something from the region it's from. Okay. And it turns out that it, this we are doing something from the region oh. it's from. I believe it's pronounced kvass. Okay. It is a Russian soft drink. Ooh. So let me get... Mom. And if, I, if what I was reading... Yeah, if what I was reading was right, I believe it's slightly alcoholic, but not to the point where like kids drink it in Russia. But <laughs> I don't say much. Well, no, but I don't think it's like I don't think it's like I think it's like super tiny amount where you okay. won't you could drink this whole thing and not even get buzzed. Okay. Well, this is somebody who hasn't had alcohol in probably a couple of years, so I'll probably be loopy by the time the episode's over. I'm only gonna take a small drink, but. It is a it is a fermented oh it's fermented That's... fermented cereal based low alcohol cereal beverage. based yes so it's it's kind of a it's kind of a drink <laughs> one of the questions can you get buzzed from kvass they wrote no you would have to drink excessive amounts okay well I'll be good then um so the thing is like read the ingredients okay like I don't think I'm gonna like it just because of what the ingredients are and that is something that I do not like. And we're going to talk about that in the side sessions, too, today, because that shows up for one of the things I'll be talking about. Is it bitters? No. Oh, okay. No, I like bitters. I'm just thinking Wisconsin's. Yeah. Fun. Okay. Rye bread? Rye bread. Crumbs. I hate... Oh, I love rye I bread. I hate... I hate rye bread rye with flour, a passion, but I flour. like the rye Sourdough. chips that are in... I feel like this is really good for your gut. I don't know. It's... I well, don't it's know. fermented. Anything fermented is really good for your gut. I just think it's going to be weird. Probably. Open her up. Okay, let me take a picture, though. I just think Man, be, uh, being made of rye bread, I don't think I'm going to like it. Well, a lot of people like rye whiskey. I don't know if I've ever had rye. I'm sure I've either. had rye whiskey at some point. Oh, I gotta get under the lights. We need better lights down here. Yeah. So we're going to try. And he's, it's fun. It was weird that this. I was already planning on doing... When, shake it up good it looks all is this gonna explode it says it's here? cloudy it's cl i know but it's all foamy on top i'm a little worried because oh. well, open it slow <laughs> especially if it's fermented <laughs> i'm putting it by the oh my gosh if it's gonna squirt everywhere shut it tight quick uh. <laughs> the foam is growing it oh is. do you see that yep. this is scary it sounds like oh my god! It sounds like most of the air is out. I'm afraid to open it. <laughs> no, it sounds like oh god! I think it's gonna overflow. Okay, put it, set it, set it down for a bit so that it doesn't, <laughs> so you're not jostling it. Do you want to see if we have something else Dang. in that box yeah, let and let it. that settle down? Like what is oh it's that? Awesome. That is coffee syrup. We've had that. Let's save that for next time. Yes. Yes, I want to say Jamie sent it to us back in like season one. And it was really good. There is something else in here. Oh, this looks like alcohol. What is this? It looks like syrup. Um, this is from Michaela, I believe. Tamworth Distilling. Um, Grade dark <laughs> what is it though oh i'm looking unholy rye what are the wow. odds that is this like <laughs> rye whiskey I, I don't know what this is it is it's rye whiskey let's save that for next what are the yeah, odds that we we're talking about rye, rye whiskey and I it's know. sitting right and here we did not know that was in there okay. that is weird that's, really weird that's a weird little synchronicity that. no we'll do a shot of that next time that's oh, weird boy. because I just it's we really just weird. got done talking about rye whiskey. Thank you, Michaela. I'm still afraid to open this. It should be it should <laughs> so be okay. Making noises. Do you hear that? Yeah. <laughs> oh.
Wow, this it is, is a long, super, dramatic pause. Yeah, it is super foamy. Okay. Well, and the bottle feels really taut. You know what I mean? There's yeah. no give? Okay. Yeah. Take, take, a, take a sniff. Oh, <laughs> it smells like beer. Seriously? It totally smells like beer, like yeasty. Well, it's fermented. It's a fermented. Okay, this is going to be interesting. Cereal-based drink. Ooh. Oh, wow. That... Does it foam up like crazy? It's like I poured a little bit in and the foam is almost <laughs> to the top of the cup. All right. There's some long pauses in there that you're going to want to edit out. Or I could do it before you leave today. Maybe, yeah. And you don't have to edit it. Edit it. Oh, that totally smells like beer. It smells like beer. Now I'm now I'm liking it. We'll see. I have to get through all this foam. It just says preservative free, cholesterol free. Serve ice cold. It's Keep refrigerating. It just says soft drink kvass. Okay. And this is a Russian, Russians. Russian beverage. Where Ready? Did he- <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to like it. I, I don't mean, think- it smells like a dark beer. Yeah. But I like dark beers. So do I. I mean, I used to. Okay, are you ready? Ready. It tastes like beer. It totally tastes like a beer. That's really good. Yeah, that's not bad. It has like I, a syrupy I don't get a. I don't get a rye taste. No. Mm. Oh, that's actually really good. Jim would like this. I really like that. I should have him taste this. Have him t- Yeah, when you go up. Mm. The, Even I like this. Yeah, I really like this. Thank you, David. Like it's carbonated, but not like obnoxiously carbonated no, like soda is. It's different, though. Of course, it's, <laughs> this it's, was a bit of a struggle to open. So yeah, maybe a lot of the carbonation different. left. It's not it, like but... a soft drink, but no. it's it's like a soft drink that tastes like I'm gonna text beer. You. Tell him to come down and try it. Mm. Okay, I really like that. I got a little. I, there is like a syrupy. Yeah, like but it's good. Taste, but I do get a little hint of rye. So ab- there, there the are aftertaste. certain beers that have a syrupy aftertaste that I do not like. Yeah. But I like this. I do too. But we'll I'm see if he's even looking at his taste. phone. Yeah, he can come down and try it. So what what are we looking at for time? <sighs> Twenty six minutes, but we had like eight minutes of yeah, banter us talking about what well, we in the were unedited about. episode. Yeah. yeah. So I think we're good. Should we jump in? Are we forgetting anything? I don't think so thank you to our coffee subscribers i think we had like yeah thank maybe you three coffee subscribers or three coffee. new coffee i think it's coffee yeah because they wouldn't say people probably get so tired of us trying to forget this <laughs> <laughs> i don't think they would say buy me a coffee if yeah. it weren't pronounced yeah. coffee Good so point. we have some three i think three new subscribers so thank you guys i swear we're gonna put this money to use at some point yeah we're still talking about i that. do want to buy lighting so that we can try doing a video episode. I feel like episode. we need to go somewhere and do, do. like an on-site yeah. investigation. Well, we might have an investigation. Episode. Coming up through Jim. Oh, that's right. I totally forgot about that. I don't want to say about, where it is because I, I don't totally, know that. Yeah, yeah, I totally forgot about that. I'm hoping we can do that this fall. And I think it'd be fun if we can time it to do our Halloween episode yes. about this investigation. Yes. I totally so, forgot about that. Yeah, I'm excited. Cool. So we're jumping into today's episode. Let's I want to apologize because I don't <laughs> feel like it's, I don't feel like I served it justice you like I wanted that. to. But I asked Krista last time after, I'm like, is there anything you want to talk about? And she suggested the second story yep. in today's. So if which, it's a stinker, blame it on me. No, it's not. It's not like both of these are weird because I thought that these were known what happened. Like it was a 100% scientific fact what oh. happened in both of these. Okay. And I didn't realize that it's kind of not. So the two we're going to be talking about today are the Tunguska event and See that five times fast. Yeah. And the uh, <laughs> lost colony of Roanoke. Yeah. That was what Krista wanted to talk about. And I thought, I, I don't know much about Roanoke, to be honest with you. I, I just know that it's a lost colony. Yeah. <laughs> like, I thought, that's I thought literally they all knew I know. what happened with both of these. Oh, okay. So the first one, we're going to talk about the Tunguska event. Okay. This comes from... I w- haven't heard of this one. Seriously? This is new to me. This is like a famous like mystery. This comes from Wikipedia. That's about right. I wouldn't know about it. On June 30th, 1908, at 717 in the morning, I think it's pronounced Avenki. I think that's the natives that live in that area of Siberia, because Siberia is where this happened. Avenki natives and Russian settlers in the hill northwest of Lake Baikal observed a bluish light nearly as bright as the sun moving across the sky and leaving a thin trail. Closer to the horizon, there was a flash producing a billowing cloud, followed by a pillar of fire that cast a red light onto the landscape. The pillar split in two and faded, turning to black. 
About 10 minutes later, there was a sound similar to that of artillery fire. Eyewitnesses closer to the explosion reported that the source of the sound moved from the east to the north of them. The sounds were accompanied by a shock wave that knocked people off their feet and broke windows hundreds of miles away. Wow. The explosion registered at seismic stations across Europe and Asia, and airwaves from the blast were detected in Germany, Denmark, Croatia, and the United Kingdom, and as far away as Washington, D.C. It's estimated that in some places, the resulting shock wave was equivalent to an earthquake measuring 5.0 on the Richter scale. Over the next few days, night skies in Asia and Europe were aglow, and there were reports of brightly lit photographs being successfully taken at midnight without the aid of flashbulbs in Sweden and Scotland. So that's pretty crazy. Yeah, that is crazy. Though the regions of Siberia in which the explosion occurred was very sparsely populated in 1908, there are accounts of the event from eyewitnesses who were in the surrounding area at the time. According to the testimony of S. Semenov, as recorded by Russian mineralogist Leonard Kulik's expedition in 1930, one of these eyewitness testimonies says, quote, At breakfast time, I was sitting by the house at Vanavara Trading Post, which is 40 miles south of the explosion, facing north. I suddenly saw that directly to the north, over Tunguska Road, the sky split into two and fire appeared high and wide over the forest. The split in the sky grew larger, and the entire northern side was covered with fire. At that moment, I became so hot that I couldn't bear it as if my shirt were on fire. From the northern side, where the fire was, came strong heat. I wanted to tear off my shirt and throw it down, but then the sky shut closed, and a strong thump sounded, and I was thrown a few meters. I lost my senses for a moment, but then my wife ran out and led me to the house. After that, such noise came as if rocks were falling or cannons were firing. The earth shook, and when I was on the ground, I pressed my head down, fearing that rocks would smash it. When the sky opened up, hot wind raced between the houses like from cannons, which left traces in the ground like pathways and it damaged some crops. Later, we saw that many windows were shattered and in the barn, part of the iron lock had snapped. Hmm. A testimony by Shushan of the Shana Gur tribe, as recorded by I. M. Susloff in 1926, this account says, quote, We had a hut by the river with my brother Shakaran. We were sleeping. Suddenly we both woke up at the same time. Somebody shoved us. We heard whistling and felt strong wind. Shakaran said, quote, Can you hear all those birds flying overhead? We were both in the hut. We couldn't see what was going on outside. Suddenly, I got shoved again, this time so hard that I fell into the fire. I got scared. Shekharin got scared, too. We started crying out for father, mother, brother, but no one answered. There was noise behind the hut. We could hear trees falling down. Shekharin and I got out of our sleeping bags and wanted to run out, but then the thunder struck. This was the first thunder. The earth began to move and rock. The wind hit our hut and knocked it over. My body was pushed down by sticks, but my head was in the clear. Then I saw a wonder. Trees were falling. The branches were on fire. It became mighty bright. How can I say this? As if there were a second sun. My eyes were hurting. I even closed them. It was like what the Russians call lightning. And immediately there was a loud thunderclap. This was the second thunder. The morning was sunny. There were no clouds. The sun was shining brightly as usual. And suddenly there came a second one. Shekharin and I had some difficulty getting out from under the remains of our hut. Then we saw that above, but in a different place, there was another flash, and loud thunder came. This was the third thunder strike. Wind came again, knocked us off our feet, struck the fallen trees. We looked at the fallen trees, watched the treetops get snapped off, watched the fires. Suddenly, Shekharin yelled, look up, and pointed with his hand. I looked up and saw another flash, and it made another thunder, but the noise was less than before. This was the fourth strike. This one sounded like normal thunder. Now I remember well that there was also one more thunder strike, but it was small and somewhere far away where the sun goes to sleep. So, from the Sabir newspaper, July 2nd, 1908, it says, quote, On the morning of 17th of June, around 9 o'clock, we observed an unusual natural occurrence. In the north village, the peasants saw to the northwest, rather high above the horizon, some strangely bright and impossible to look at bluish-white heavenly body, which for ten minutes moved downwards. The body appeared as a pipe, i.e. a cylinder. 
The sky was cloudless. Only a small dark cloud was observed in the general direction of the bright body. It was hot and dry. As the body neared the ground of the forest, the bright body seemed to smudge and then turned into a giant billow of black smoke, and a loud knocking, which was not thunder, was heard as if large stones were falling or artillery was fired. All the buildings shook. At the same time, the cloud began emitting flames of uncertain shapes. All villagers were stricken with panic and took to the streets. Women cried, thought it was the end of the world. The author of these lines was meantime in the forest about 6.4 kilometers north of Kurnesk and heard to the northeast some kind of artillery barrage that repeated at intervals of 15 minutes at least 10 times. In the village, a few buildings in the walls facing northeast had their windows broken and glass shook. That's crazy. Yeah. From the, oh boy, Krasonayarts newspaper from July 13th, 1908. <laughs> Krasonayarts. <laughs> on the 17th, an unusual atmospheric event was occurred, was observed. <laughs> <laughs> At 7.43 a.m., the noise akin to a strong wind was heard. Immediately afterward, a horrific thump sounded, followed by an earthquake that literally shook the buildings as if they were hit by a large log or a heavy rock. The first thump was followed by a second and then a third. Then the interval between the first and third thumps was accompanied by an unusual underground rattle, similar to a railway upon which dozens of trains are traveling at the same time. Afterward, for five to six minutes, an exact likeness of artillery fire was heard. Fifty to sixty salvos, in short, equal intervals, which got progressively weaker. After about 1.5 to 2 minutes after one of the barrages, six more thumps were heard like cannon firing, but individual, loud, and accompanied by tremors. The sky at first began to uh, appear to be clear. There was no wind and no clouds. Upon closer inspection of the north, where most of the thumps were heard, a kind of ashen cloud was seen near the horizon, which kept getting smaller and more transparent, and by around 2 or 3 p.m. had completely disappeared. Hmm. So there are some accounts of what, what the happened. event was. Okay. I can't wait to hear theories because I'm clueless. It was not until more than a decade after the event that any scientific analysis of the region took place, in part due to the isolation of the area and significant political upheaval affecting Russia in the 1910s. In 1921, the Russian mineralogist Leonid Kulik led a team to the Podkamenea. Tunguska River Basin to conduct a survey for the Soviet Academy of Sciences. Although they never made it to the central blast area, the many local accounts of the event led Kulik to believe that the explosion had been caused by a giant meteorite impact. Upon returning, he persuaded the Soviet government to fund an expedition to the actual impact zone based on the prospect of salvaging meteoric iron. So that was one way to get them interested in funding mm. it is like, we'll get you guys a bunch of iron yeah. if you let us go check out this area. Because he was convinced it was a meteor, a, me a meteorite hit. Hmm. Kulik led a scientific expedition to the, to, to, <laughs> <laughs> to the Tunguska blast site in 1927. He hired local Avenki hunters to guide his team to the center of the blast area where they expected to find a big impact crater. To their surprise, there was no crater anywhere to be found at ground zero. Instead, they found a zone, roughly five miles across, where the trees were scorched and devoid of branches, but still standing upright. Trees more distant from, distant from the center had been partially scorched and knocked down in a direction away from the center, creating a large radial pattern of downed trees. In the 1960s, it was established that the zone of leveled forest occupied an area of 830 square miles, its shape resembling a giant spread-eagled butterfly with a wingspan of 43 miles and a body length of 34 miles. That's a huge yeah, that is huge. area mm -hmm. where these trees were knocked down. Mm -hmm. In the 1960s, I just read that. <laughs> uh, and it was estimated that whatever happened had been the equivalent of a 20 megaton nuclear bomb Dang. so this was huge yeah uh and that's what i got for what happened wow okay uh and i always just thought that, that would be freaky to knew. experience yeah so i have a bunch of theories uh that tells me we don't know what it was no, like there's uh, there's people that believe they think they know what it is, but then other people disagree with that. Hmm. But we'll get into that. So there's a lot, there's quite a few theories. The first theory, which wins my goofiest theory uh, award for this, is that 
it's believed some people believe that it was a nuclear bomb from the future because they did not have nuclear bombs yet at the time. Mm. So people theorize that in the future, a nuclear war happens and one of the bombs manages to somehow get sent back in time and explode there because they said, this sounds like a nuclear blast. I mean, it does have all the like hallmarks. Like whatever came down blasted in the air above the area because there's no impact crater, but it devastated the area. But did people suffer no, nuclear? No, ra- yeah. no radiation, no. Right. But, you know, people theorize... There are uh, bombers w- that have nuclear weapons that either lost their nuclear weapons. Like, they're, <laughs> it's scary great. to think of that there's lakes oh where there God. are nuclear bombs at the bottom of the lake oh that were dropped accidentally. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, and bombers are reported to have gone missing that have nuclear bombs. So mm. people theorize that maybe one of these bombers went back in time and dropped the bomb on. But it's just... I guess. I'm not buying it. <laughs> I'm not, Sorry. I'm not buying the bombs like from the future. There's a more logical future. explanation. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not buying the bombs from the future theory. Nope. Uh, another theory is the Egda or the Egdi. The local Evanic or Avanic people attributed the blast to a great shaman called Megancan. He would get people to fire a rifle at him, and he would catch the bullet when it came out of his body and show it to everyone there. He would then stab a knife into his chest, and no wound could be seen. So he's like Chris Angel. Like, <laughs> like, like Chris and Chris, the David Blaine. Does he do it in a plastic box? The David Blaine of Tunguska. Uh, for a long time, there had been war and feuds between the... I never know how to pronounce this because it's written differently in other places. Um, Evenki? Oh, sorry, I had to Evenk. yawn. Um, a venki, a venki, sounds Russian. But this one calls it calls it uh, a vank. Mm. So I'm just gonna say vank. For a long time, there had been war and feuds between the Evenk clans living along the tributaries of the Lower Tunguska. This led to rival shamans sending their evil spirits against each other, causing diseases and other troubles. Then it's said that Megan Khan called upon the Agdi. The Agdi is the god of thunder who looks like an old man, but he also called upon the Agdi birds, the thunderbirds, big black birds made of iron with fiery eyes. The beating of their wings is said to cause thunder and lightning flashes from their eyes. Ancestors of the Agdi live in Kergu, the underworld, as do the souls of shamans, so many of them were friends with the shamans, and this relationship had been passed on to their descendants. It was said that an evil shaman could call on the egg D to to do harm to anyone he has a grudge against. This happened in the early morning of 30th June 1908. A flock of egg D were said to be called by the shaman Magankan. The egg D came down on the territory of the Shinagir clan. According to the website Advancing Physics News, Quote, the local natives attributed the blast to Agda, the god of thunder, to punish the Avenki tribe for their internal disputes. They proclaimed the blast site a sacred space and guarded it from outsiders, one reason it took nearly two decades before the first scientific expeditions arrived. Hmm. So one of the theories is that shamans from different tribes were fighting and called upon this god of thunder to destroy the other people. Okay. So that's another theory. Sure. Another big theory, UFO crash. And this was the one like in the 70s when I remember reading stuff in books of the unexplained. It was brought up a lot that it was possibly a UFO crash. According to a May 29th, 2009 issue of the Hindustan Times, quote, It's believed alien spacecraft crashed into a giant meteor 100 years ago to stop it from hitting Earth, according to a Russian scientist. According to the Fox News reports, Dr. Yuri Labvin, president of the Tunguska Spatial Phenomenon Foundation, insists that an alien spacecraft sacrificed itself to prevent a giant meteor from slamming into the planet above Siberia on June 30th, 1908. Most scientists say that exploding meteorite caused the event, which flattened 80 million trees across 100 miles. But Labvin thinks that quartz slabs with strange markings found at the site are remnants of an alien control panel, which fell to the ground after the UFO slammed into the giant rock. 
He says, quote, we don't have any technologies that can print such kind of drawings on crystals. We also found ferrum silicate that cannot be produced anywhere except in space. Hmm. Hmm. So he believes that a uh, UFO saw that a meteorite was going to hit Earth and it crashed into the meteorite to save us. Aww. So thank you. That's nice. Thanks, random alien dude. <laughs> random alien. Maybe it was a dudette. It could have been a dudette. <laughs> Maybe it was J-Rod or whichever one is, is said to be at uh, Area 51. Oh, okay. Remember going back to the area that they had an alien named J-Rod? Yes. Yep. There is a really, I don't know why I just thought of this. A pretty decent found footage film called, I think it's yeah, called Area yeah, 51. I've, I've read about it, but I've never seen it. I watched it and it was actually really creepy. Really? I ha- I, I recommend it. That. It's one of those things where they keep going further and further and lower yeah. and lower. And you're like, oh, this is getting stressful. Yeah. It's that kind of thing. I'll have to check that out. I think it was called Area 51. Uh, from an August 12, 2004 Space.com article called, quote, Russian alien spaceship claims raise eyebrows, comma, skepticism, says, quote, an expedition of Russian researchers claims to have found evidence that an alien spaceship had something to do with a huge explosion over Siberia in 1908. Experts in asteroids and comets have long said the massive blast was caused by a space rock. The new ET claim is, quote, a rather stupid hoax, one scientist said today, and it's one with a rich history. The latest claim was written up by newswires and was making the internet rounds Thursday morning. According to Agents French Press, I think that's a France newspaper, the scientists say they found a, quote, extraterrestrial device that explains one of 20th century's biggest scientific mysteries, a catastrophe that flattened some 800 square miles of Siberian forest in a region called Tunguska. Various other news reports told of a technical device and a large block made with metal. The researchers were said to chip off a piece of this for laboratory study. The Russian research team is called the Tunguska Space Phenomenon Foundation and is led by Yuri Labvin. He said in late July that an expedition to the scene would seek evidence that aliens were involved. Labvin was quoted by the Russian newspaper Pravda as saying, quote, We intend to uncover evidences that will prove the fact that it was not a meteorite that rammed the Earth, but a UFO. Benny Heiser, a researcher at Liverpool John Moores University in the UK, says, quote, I'm afraid this is a rather stupid hoax. The Russian team stupidly stated long before they went to Siberia that the main intention of their expedition was to find the remnants of an alien spaceship. And bingo, a week later, that's what they claim to have found. Yeah, I guess you should really be going there just to see what you find, not looking for something specific. Yep. Pizer told Space.com, quote, It's a rather sad comment on the current state of the anything-goes attitude among some science correspondents that such blatant rubbish is being reported without the slightest hint of skepticism. He sounds like a fun guy to, <laughs> at parties. <laughs> Astronomer Philip Plate, author of the myth-debunking book Bad Astronomy, agrees with Pizer that the Russian researchers' intentions for finding ET evidence hurts their case. They're not undertaking a scientific expedition that is an unbiased investigation to see what happens, Plate wrote Thursday in an email. They're going to try to prove their preconceived ideas. That's not science. That's religion. And it almost certainly means that they are more willing to ignore or play down any evidence that it was a comet or rock impact while playing up anything they find consistent with their hypothesis. Whatever anyone believes, Plate points out that proof is what's important. I'm not saying they didn't find an alien ship, he says. I am saying that it's A, unlikely in the extreme, and B, they are predisposed to make such claims, which means we need to be very skeptical, even more so than usual in such cases. If they provide sufficient evidence, then scientists are obligated to investigate, of course. But given everything that I've read, their evidence to even consider a non-natural cause is pretty weak. Plate has even thought about what evidence might be necessary. A chunk of debris would help, but not just any sort of material. He said, quote, It would need to be a weird ratio of isotopes, for example, or clear evidence of a long-duration space travel. Even then, they must be careful. Man-made space debris does rain down on Earth all the time. Plate, a naturally skeptical person, is willing to wait and see. He says, quote, let's see what these guys bring back. In the end, it's not what they can claim, but what they can support with factual evidence that counts. The burden of proof is clearly and heavily on them. 
Their search for a more for more unlikely explanations has led to the site becoming a major mecca for UFO enthusiasts, spawning a Tunguska meteorite museum, and scores of photographs are what are claimed to be parts of extraterrestrial craft discovered in the area. Hmm. So that's a biggie, is that it yeah. was caused by a UFO. Mm-hmm. Uh, whether or not it actually was, I don't know. Like, I, this is a, Siberia, this place is not easy to get to. Right. From what it sounds like. Oh my God, that is so foamy. And for someone who can't burp. No. This should be interesting. <laughs> yeah, oh my God, my stomach's going to be making such noises. So what do you think, UFO? I like the idea that I mean, an alien of course, sacrificed yeah. himself to save the planet. Because a meteorite or whatever doesn't make sense because there was no contact with... Yep. But to, for it to have that kind well, of devastation on the surrounding get to area... We're going to get to that. But okay. UFO one, I can buy more than I can a, buy it. I can buy more than a time-traveling nuclear yes, bomb. Yes, 100%. Or the, or the Thunder Gods. Yeah, totally. This next one... Is my personal favorite. Okay. I don't know if I buy it. It's not super viable, but you like the idea. But I really like this idea. And this theory said that it was Nikola Tesla's weapon being tested. Oh, okay. From teslauniverse.com, an uh, article on teslauniverse.com called, quote, The Death Ray of Nikola Tesla. It writes, when Tesla realized, as he pointed out in the 1900th century article, which was called the problem of increasing human energy. He pointed out that economic forces would not allow the development. The uh, duh, I sounded like a really Wisconsin there. That economic forces, as opposed to <laughs> usual, <laughs> opposed to the usual, <laughs> that economic forces would not allow the development of a new type of electrical generator able to supply power without burning fuel. He was led to recognize that the transmission of electrical energy to any distance through the media as by far the best solution to the great problem of harnessing the sun's energy for man to use. His idea was that relatively few generating plants located near waterfalls would supply his very high energy transmitters, which in turn would send power through the earth to be picked up wherever it was needed. So Tesla's idea was to have these generating plants that would pump energy into the earth and then anybody around the earth would be able to tap into that power Hmm. to use it. Okay. The plan would require several of his transmitters to rhythmically pump huge amounts of electricity into the earth at pressures on the order of 100 million volts. The earth would become like a huge ball inflated to a great electrical potential. This sounds safe. (laughs) I was just thinking that. <laughs> this reminds me of when they wanted to put, like we talked about in yes. the last episode, with yes. the, the, underground. Uh, the underground power cables mm-hmm. to make us a giant antenna, to make Wisconsin a giant antenna. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Earth would become like a huge ball inflated to a great electrical potential, but pulsing to Tesla's imposed beat. Tesla said his transmitter could produce 100 million volts of pressure with currents up to 1,000 amps, which is a power level of 100 billion watts. <laughs> I don't really want to wow. be trying this. If it was resonating at a radio frequency of 2 megahertz, then the energy released during one period of its oscillation would be 100,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,
an explosion estimated to be the equivalent of 10 to 20 megatons of TNT flattened 500,000 acres of pine forest near the Tunguska River in central Siberia. Whole herds of reindeer were destroyed. Oh, that's sad. The explosion was heard over a radius of 600 to 620 miles. When an expedition was made to the area in 1927 to find evidence of the meteorite presumed to have caused the blast, no impact crater was found. When the ground was drilled for pieces of nickel, iron, or stone, the main, con uh, the main constitu constitu constituents <laughs> of meteorites, nothing was found down to a depth of 118 feet. So it doesn't seem like it was a meteorite. It doesn't feel like it was something natural. Yeah. It feels like it had to have been an explosive of some kind. Associating Tesla with the Tunguska event comes close to putting the inventor's power transmission idea into the same speculative category as ancient astronauts. However, by looking at the above timeline, it can be seen that real historical facts point to the possibility that this event was caused by a test firing of Tesla's energy weapon. In 1907 and 1908, Tesla wrote about the destructive effects of his energy transmitter. His Wardenclyffe transmitter was much larger than the Colorado Springs device that destroyed the power station's generator. We need to do an episode about Tesla because he was like mm -hmm. a fascinating guy. Yeah. His new also slightly terrifying. Yes. His new transmitter would be capable of effects many orders of magnitude greater than the Colorado device. In 1915, he said that he already built a transmitter that, quote, when unavoidable, may be used to destroy property and life. So that's creepy. Mm -hmm. Finally, a 1934 letter from Tesla to J.P. Morgan, uncovered by Tesla biographer Margaret Cheney, seems to conclusively point to an energy weapon test. In an effort to raise money for his defensive system, he wrote, quote, The flying machine has completely demoralized the world, so much so in that in some cities, as London and Paris, people are in mortal fear from aerial bombing. The new means I have perfected afford absolute protection against this and other forms of attack. These new discoveries I have carried out experimentally on a limited scale created a profound impression. So mm -hmm. that's him saying that he's tested some of his weapons. I, I don't get, think it's that far-fetched. It's, it's kind of not. It's really not. Again, the evidence is circumstantial, but to use the language of criminal investigation, Tesla had motive and means to be the cause of the Tunguska event. He also seems to confess to such a test having taken place before 1915. His transmitter could generate energy levels and frequencies that would release the destructive force of 10 megatons or more of TNT. Like we know this thing actually did exist that yeah, he said that he, he created. He'd been, he'd been working on this. Okay. And, the over, and, and the overlooked genius was desperate. The nature of the Tunguska event also was not inconsistent with what would happen during the sudden release of wireless power. Uh, and some people believe that Tesla intended for this to happen at the North Pole, where Admiral Perry was on his way when he was going. I, I don't remember if he was the first one to do an expedition to the mm -hmm. North Pole. Mm -hmm. But it's believed that Tesla intended for him to find evidence of a cataclysmic explosion on the ice at the pole. But that, And he was going to say, no, that was my device that did it. But Tesla found out that directing the energy beam turned out to be tougher than expected, and it accidentally happened at Tunguska hmm. instead. So that's, that's my favorite theory. But what's weird is that, um, and I didn't think about this when I was actually uh, putting my notes together, but it's one of the eyewitness accounts talks about rumbling under the earth. Hmm. And some of the other like theories before it happened? some of the like when it was happening but okay. some of the other theories coming up don't that people believe kind of don't make sense for why it would be rumbling like the people said it was like the sound of a bunch of trains moving under right. the earth where yeah. if it was tesla sending that energy weapon through the earth up that would make I sense i don't know i like i like the tesla's energy weapon idea. and he could have it could have triggered what like an earthquake or something yeah potentially yeah you know and and you know, like some people believe he intended for it to do this at the north pole some people believe he intended for it to happen where it did because he was looking for a place that was land but it was also there also weren't a lot of people there that would get hurt in mm -hmm. his test so i don't know that's an interesting theory Another theory, it was a miniature black hole. Oh. From a, t this, I had to go way back for this one. Time Magazine article from October 8th, 1973, called, quote, Science, a Black Hole in Siberia. The article says, 
University of Texas physicist Albert A. Jackson IV and Michael P. Ryan Jr. have proposed that the 1908 explosion was caused by a black hole, a bizarre celestial object scientists believe exists in great numbers throughout the universe. One of the implications of the theory of general relativity is that when giant stars exhaust their nuclear fuel, they collapse so suddenly under their own tremendous gravity that their remnants are compressed into a sphere only about two miles or so across and weighing trillions of tons. Hmm. The gravitational field of the sphere is so intense that no light can escape from it, thus the name black hole. Clearly, such an object would have caused far more cataclysmic damage than the Siberian explosion. But in recent years, several scientists have proposed the existence of tiny black holes even smaller than a speck of dust. Some of these may have been formed in the so-called Big Bang, the great explosion that cosmologists believe marked the birth of the universe some 10 to 15 billion years ago. Others could be fragments from collisions between larger black holes. Jackson and Ryan calculate that if such an object intercepted the Earth's path at a velocity of about 25,000 miles per hour, it would have set off a shockwave similar to the one from the Siberian blast. They report in nature that the black hole's passage through the atmosphere would have left a deep blue trail of ionized particles like the streak seen by witnesses near the 1908 blast. Finally, the energy released by the black hole could easily have caused the observed damage without leaving material residue or a crater. Jackson and Ryan offer a concrete check for their fantastic suggestion. Witnesses at the Tunguska blast indicated that whatever caused it streaked towards the Earth at an angle of 30 degrees from the horizon. If the object was actually a black hole, it would have easily penetrated the Earth in an almost straight line and emerged eight minutes later on the other side of the planet, about 1,000 miles east of Nova Scotia, triggering underwater and atmospheric shockwaves and drawing off a thin geyser-like column of water as it flew back into space. Jackson and Ryan suggest that their theory may be supported by a search of oceanog- oceanographic oceanographic uh, water records and ship's logs for any reports of strange doings in the North Atlantic on the day of the 1908 Siberian explosion. And other people believe that it might not have been a black hole, but it might have been antimatter, a piece of antimatter that that somehow ended up in Earth's atmosphere hmm. and blew up because antimatter and matter cannot meet because they will annihilate. From a historyrundown.com article called, quote, Four Most Ridiculous Theories About the Tunguska Event, the article says, According to many so-called experts, the explosion might supposedly have been caused by annihilation, a physical process that occurs when a subatomic particle collides with its respective antiparticle of the opposite charge, producing immense amounts of energy. According to this theory, first suggested in 1941 by Lincoln La Paz, the Tunguska event was likely caused by the annihilation of a chunk of antimatter colliding with Earth. Although the antimatter theory explains the observed luminous phenomena and why no remnants of asteroids or comets were found in the area, existence of such large antimatter chunks is often deemed to be theoretically impossible. In addition, annihilation of the alleged chunk of antimatter would probably happen in the uppermost atmospheric levels. So, that's... yeah, I don't, I don't know enough about science to say no, whether or not. But that's I don't. If it was an, I, like anti, I don't know enough about antimatter and matter. Right. But you would assume that antimatter would not have been able to get that far into the atmosphere right. where it would be that close to the Earth. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't know. Another theory is a natural gas explosion. Hmm. And I guess, but that's a heck of an explosion. Yeah. But Earth does release yeah. natural gas. It's and where it comes I don't know, from. <laughs> I don't know what would have sparked it. Yeah. Hmm. But some, so all I have for this is it's possible, I guess. Sure. So I don't know. It'd be funny if it were something that mundane. Well, and we're like, yeah, that could be it. I mean, it, it could be, but it just seems like way too big of an explosion yeah for it to be that you know too widespread like uh, one of the one of the uh, i heard about this actually on the sofa king podcast and one of them suggested it was like a combination of natural gas and mosquitoes that mosquitoes, <laughs> mosquitoes? the natural gas exploded causing in the fireball like was shrapnel? mosquitoes Hmm. fire like yeah so that's like one of the weirder theories too is that that's it was, a weird theory that is a weird theory 
But the one that I kind of thought was actually it was an object from space that exploded and fragmented before contacting the ground. BBC News article from June 26, 2007 called, quote, Scientists have identified a possible crater left by the biggest space impact in modern times, says, A university team says a lake near the epicenter of the blast may be occupying a crater hollowed out by a chunk of rock that hit the ground. Lake Checo, although shallow, does fit the proportions of a small bowl-shaped impact crater, say the Italy-based scientists. But nobody noticed it at the time? <sighs> Well, the thing is, it's far away from, it's far, it's kind of far away from the impact point, but they theorize that it bounced from the impact point to become, a lot of people say no. A lot uh, of people aren't, a lot of people aren't just, buying it. Yeah. The investigation of the lake's, lake bottom's geology reveals a funnel-like shape not seen in neighboring lakes. In addition, a geophysical survey of the lake bed has turned up an unusual feature about 10 meters down, which could either be compacted lake sediments or a buried fragment of space rock. However, a key feature of other impact craters is conspicuously missing from Lake Checo, a flap around the crater rim of upside-down material tossed a short distance from the crater by mm, the impact, sure. which I totally understand. Yeah. Dr. Collins added that if pieces of the space rock had survived the airburst, they would have been too small and traveling too slow to have generated a crater the size of Lake Checo. An impact would have felled also felled trees all around the crater, yet there appears to be trees older than 100 years old still standing mm. around the lake today. Yeah, that doesn't make sense. So then it kind of went from there to the idea that it was caused by a comet, nucleus which is a large lump of dirty ice that would explode in an airburst. Like a meteorite made of rock mm -hmm. would hit the planet, but a comet made of ice would, you know, probably blow up or whatever before it actually hit the surface of the planet. Okay. In 2020, Dr. Sergei Karpov, leading researcher at Kerensky Physics Institute in Krasnoyarsk, oh, I'm so bad with Russian <laughs> names, and his peers argue, quote, the Tunguska event was caused by an iron asteroid body which passed through the Earth's atmosphere and continued to the near sol solar orbit. So that's another one that says what happened was it was a, a meteorite or an, an asteroid body, a meteorite, that entered and then bounced back up into space. Think of like skipping a rock. Sure. What did it bounce off of? the atmosphere i guess okay and they think that it's it's like skipping a rock where you skip a rock across a pond and that would have created some it, kind of a impact blast yeah, because it came came down and then bounced back up and the coming down and bouncing back up is what created the impact blast so there was no crater but it flattened but you know i don't know weren't there like multiple sounds too like thunder yes yeah did it bounce several times? <laughs> I don't know. From the Fortean Forums, which is a great website. Like, I love their forums. Somebody wrote, I saw a documentary some time ago that covered this and showed the work that was done by the Soviets investigating this. They theorized that the explosion was an airburst of a small, dense object. The airburst was inferred from the butterfly pattern of the main devastation. This pattern was consistent with the explosion being at some 2,000 feet or more of an object traveling at an oblique angle. The trajectory, blast pattern, and explosive effects were finally theorized to be a small asteroid composed of iron and nickel approximately the size of a small car. The density, speed, and friction caused it to superheat and detonate, giving the results, the results seen. But that four most ridiculous theories article says, mathematical models indicate the Tunguska event was actually caused by an explosion of a small comet, Moscow University professor Samuel Gregorian claimed in 1976 core of the comet is composed of frozen gases, ice, and cosmic dust. During its passage through the Earth's atmosphere, it would be rapidly heated, causing immediate evaporation and explosion. The released energy would correspond to the estimated 40 megatons. Although this theory, first suggested in 1930 by British meteorologist Francis Whipple, explains the strange luminous phenomena observed by the eyewitnesses of the Tunguska event, the majority of scientists consider it to be very improbable. They often point out that a fragile comet body ought to have already disintegrated in the uppermost layers of the atmosphere, while the object that caused the event apparently remained intact until it reached the lower atmospheric layers. Hmm. So some people say it 
couldn't have been a comet because it would have been destroyed higher up where it would not have gotten that close to the earth right and that's what i kind of assumed people knew that it was yeah. but a lot of people disagree with that so i got what do you think hmm. i mean <laughs> it's i don't know <coughs> the one is it like, weird the, that i feel like the tesla thing is the most reasonable <laughs> explanation like the sofa king podcast that they kind of buy the one where because it was coming in at an angle it bounced it skipped off the earth's atmosphere and went back into space you know, I guess I can kind of see that, but I don't know physics enough yeah. to understand whether or not that would cause a would blast, have been like, like that. an explosion. Yeah, and it was mm. the actual coming down in the explosion, maybe that launched it back up into space before it hit the planet. I mean, I don't know. I I like Tesla. It still feels man made to me, like yeah. some kind of bomb or some kind of weird. A weapon. lot of people said it's very reminiscent of a nuclear blast, mm-hmm. but there was no radiation, and we didn't have nuclear bombs in mm-hmm. nine in nineteen oh eight, as far as still, anybody knows. Alien spacecraft or Tesla? Yeah, this is <laughs> what I'm going with. This is one of those ones where like the paranormal actually is more reasonable. Actually kind of makes more sense. You know, if it was a meteorite, there would be a crater, and we would have found metal from from meteorites. The comet one, I think, is the most likely, and that it, for just some fluke reason, it got closer to the ground than it, it should have, mm-hmm. and it's some weird it's one in a it's billion chance. melting or whatever made it blow up. So, I mean, I could see that. I do kind of buy. I don't know enough about physics, but I do, do they kind just of explode. <laughs> I do kind of buy the skipping rock one where meteorite mm. came in bounced off at an angle and yeah. kept going into space and miniature I black hole one i'm not really buying yeah that just seems uh, so unlikely but i like tesla's i do too weapon <laughs> kind especially of since we know he was doing he stuff was like working that. on that stuff yeah hmm. so there you go that is the tunguska event you didn't know anything okay. about that? No, I didn't. It's weird. Like, if you look at it, if you Google it, there's just pictures of flattened trees hmm. as far as the eye can see. So whatever this was, it was, was crazy massively powerful. Massively powerful, yeah. Which is reminiscent of a nuclear blast. We've seen the aftermath yeah, of that. Yeah, but no radiation. Right. You know, so I don't know. Hmm. I, are we going to go with Tesla's weapon? That's what I'm going with. Which is frightening. If it that's, is very frightening. If that's true. That dude was working yeah. on some creepy stuff. Tesla's like a fascinating guy. Wow. Like we really, maybe next season we need to do. And We uh, should. Because we've talked about him. He's come up in our totally in our stuff from time to time. So we need to do an episode about Tesla. He was up to some weird stuff. He was. So there you go. There is the Tunguska event. Tunguska. What do you guys think? What do you guys think? Interesting. It's we- but it's freaky to think, say it was a meteorite. How lucky are we that that has not happened right. over like New York right, or something? Because they, some of the articles said if this would have happened like over a big city today, yeah, there would be, be millions of people yeah. dead. That's why it just seems so like, I don't know. It's so rare. It is. Obviously. It is. But for it to happen over a relatively unpopulated place seems yeah. like a lucky break so maybe it totally. was a sweet alien that's like i, I got this one guys I got, yeah, this is on me. This is on i'll me. take one for the team what time are we looking at uh, an hour and 12 minutes okay. not bad not bad at all now on to roanoke yes. this one was interesting to me because i knew very little about this one but again in the 70s i read so many like, if you go to the grocery store, they always had those, like, cheap books at the... Remember, like, little tiny books? Super tiny. This was probably before your time. But at the checkout registers, oh, they would have... And it was always, like... That kind of rings the a unexplained bell. unexplained tales of the unexplained. And I would always get those because I was... As a kid, I was fascinated by hmm. paranormal, the unexplained stuff. And they would always talk about Roanoke. But I didn't really know a lot about it. And no. you suggested it. And I'm like, you know what? Let's I do don't this. really know a lot about it. Well, we're about to find out. So most of this maybe. comes from, I think, three different articles. One of these websites I love, it is AnnaDorelliAnderson.com. She's like a historian. Okay. Uh, it comes from her February 9th, 2021 posting called, quote, The Lost Colony of Roanoke, Seven Theories on What Happened. A HistoryCollection.com article from August 19th, 2017 called, quote, The Lost Colony of Roanoke, Eight Theories About the Mysterious Island and Its Inhabitants, and a HowStuffWorks.com article called, quote, What Happened to the Lost Colony at Roanoke? 
So in 1584, Queen Elizabeth I gave Sir Walter Raleigh royal charter to colonize North America to establish a base from which England could raid Spanish treasure fleets coming their south, coming to their South and Central American colonies. Raleigh sent the first expedition to explore the eastern coast of North America. It landed on Roanoke Island and established good relations with the Crow. The Crow. There's a there's a group of Native Americans. I think they're Croatoans. Oh, then we're not talking about Croatians. No, I think it's the Croatoans. <laughs> okay. It landed on Roanoke Island. They landed on Roanoke Island and established good relations with the Croatoans, the Native Americans living on the island. The expedition brought two Croatoans back to England with them, and the natives explained how to live on the island. So they were they had a good relationship with the Croatoans. Because they didn't come on, come in and like destroy and pillage and murder yeah. and okay. Yeah. A second expedition was then organized, and Sir Walter Raleigh attempted to establish a settlement on Roanoke Island in April of 1585. This one didn't go well. Commanded by Sir Richard Grenville, who was Raleigh's cousin. The excursion was comprised of seven vessels and dozen of, dozens of men, including Thomas Cavendish, Thomas Harriet, Philip Amadas, and John White, who we will hear about again later. They left the port of Plymouth on April 9th, 1585, and arrived at their destination on June 26th. That sounds like a pretty quick time to mm-hmm. sail from England to the United States. What was the time frame? April to June. Oh, yeah. Two months, huh? Upon landing, the men immediately encountered the natives, the native Secotan Indians, an Algonquin people, with whom they would have a contentious relationship with during the short year they would spend with them. The hostility began soon after their arrival when the English accused the Secotan, I don't know how to pronounce it, S-E-C-O-T-A-N, Secotans? That sounds right. Accused the Secotans of stealing and setting fire to their homes and crops. So right there, things are not off to a real great start. Right. Following a number of hardships, the final straw for the colonists came when they discovered that the Sectoans, after refusing to sell them corn, planned to massacre them on June 10th, 1586. The English were able to thwart this scheme, in turn murdering all those who took part in planning it, and abandoned the colony soon after. With the help of Sir Francis Drake, they withdrew on June 19th, arriving at their native Portsmouth on July 27th. So they're they're saying that this group, the Secotones, was going to massacre them, so they massacred them first. But who knows? Mm-hmm. You know? They just arrive on their land. Yeah. Probably claimed a bunch of stuff that wasn't theirs. Yeah. yeah. So the first We know how this goes. The first expedition went really well. We became yeah. we became BFFs with the Crotones <laughs> and BFFs. everything was cool. Yep. Second time, not so much with that group. Mm-hmm. I need a drink of my fizzy drink your russian beverage what does it taste like is it still carbonated? it's still good but it's so carbonated that when i put it when i is, huh? when i swig it i feel like it's gonna squirt out of my mouth it's so carbonated so sir walter <laughs> now it just smells like stale beer it does oh that's not a good smell this sir... is like you went to a party and there's still <laughs> cups of beer sitting out the next, next morning. morning that's what it smells yeah. like you think it's water and you reach like up there and grab should it be like, like a cigarette butt in there. <laughs> oh my god, there should totally be a cigarette butt in there. <laughs> so gross. Sir Walter Raleigh funded another expedition. On May 18th, 1587, Englishman John White, along with some 115 others, John White was on the second expedition. Okay. But he went that didn't back, go well. That didn't go well, but he went back to England and came back for the third one. John White, along with some 115 others, including his wife, his pregnant daughter, Eleanor Dare, and his son-in-law, Aninius, Aninius Dare, left England for the Americas. The party arrived on Roanoke Island off the coast of present-day North Carolina just a few months later. It is here that the Roanoke colony was established in July 1587 with John as their governor. The group was short on supplies, and John was convinced by everybody else in the colony to sail back to England for more supplies in late August, expecting to return shortly. Hmm. Not so late much. Late August, okay. Not so much. Side note, 
John's daughter, Eleanor, had her daughter on August 18, 1587, and named her Virginia in honor of her being the first Christian-slash-English child born in Virginia, the first of Anglo-Americans, and that's Virginia Dare, hmm. who, who was like a famous historical person. Virginia Dare, hey. Virginia Dare. <laughs> Virginia Dare, hey. That would have been if they landed in Wisconsin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> However, when John arrived in England that November, he soon realized that returning shortly would not be the case. Though the Anglo-Spanish War had been going on for at least a couple of years by this point, the unofficial war was heating up and Queen Elizabeth did not want any ships to leave England in case they were needed. While John attempted to return to Roanoke several times during this period, he was ultimately unable to until August of 1590, some three years later. Hmm. So that sucks. Yeah. You know, they, 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 can, they talk him into going back and getting supplies. His wife, daughter, uh, grandchild. grandchild, and he doesn't get back for three years. Wow. He was heartened to see, quote, a great smoke rise in the Isle Roanoke near the place where I left our colony in the year 1587. But what he found upon docking was nothing less than shocking. <laughs> that rhymes. <laughs> the site had apparently been fortified, but everyone was gone. Not a single soul remained. The only clues they found were the word Croatoan carved into a wooden post and Cro, C-R-O, carved into a tree. Side note number two. Croatone was the name of the nearby present-day Hatteras Island and a tribal group of Carolina Algonquins. John and those with him tried to investigate to search for the missing souls, but were met with rough seas and an approaching storm. They lost the anchor to one of their two ships and seven of the eleven crewmen drowned. They planned to come back to search later on, but that never happened. So that kind of sucks. Wow. Yeah. In 1602, Sir Walter, Sir Walter, I keep calling him (laughs) Walty. Sir Walter Raleigh decided to find out what happened himself. He hired his own ship and paid his sailors wages so that they would focus on the mission. They reached Virginia, but a severe storm forced them to go back to England before they were able to reach Roanoke Island. When he arrived back in England, Raleigh was arrested for treason before he could organize any more missions back to Roanoke. That seems wild to me that you make it almost all the way there. Yeah. And you're like, oh, weather's bad. Let's turn around and go all the way back to England. Yeah. Yeah. In 1603, another fact-finding mission to Roanoke led by Bartholomew (laughs) Bartholomew (laughs) Gilbert ended in disaster. A storm blew the expedition off course, and the team that went ashore was attacked and killed by Native Americans. The remaining crew returned to England without having found any information on the colonists of Roanoke. Hmm. So that's what I got. Wow. Yeah. That's it, huh? That's really, that's really it. Wow. I mean, I have a ton of theories, but okay. But yeah, he. I feel so bad for him because, you know, he goes back hey to guys, England. guys, I'll be right back. Thinks he's going to grab some supplies and come right back. And it's three years. Wow. And he couldn't exactly, like, text anybody to be like, right. you know, how are you, Send LOL? Send a carrier pigeon. Like... Yeah. Like, there was no way to contact them. He finally returns three years later. Uh, it looked like the colony had been fortified, but there is nothing except the word Croton on a tree and a CRO or a, on a post and CRO written on a tree. Mm. So, I mean, I have a theory. Do you? They were wiped out by the people whose land that actually belonged pretty to. Sure that, pretty sure that is one of the theories. <laughs> Not 100% sure I have these numbered right. I don't. So we're just going to, I'm not going to name them. We're just going to wing just, it? We're just going to wing it. Okay. So the first theory that I'm looking at, and again, I'm going from weird theories to plausible theories. Okay. The first theory I'm looking at is paranormal slash missing 411. Ooh. And this this does come up a lot in mm-hmm. the missing 411 stuff. I mean, I don't know. It was it was the... Were any of their belongings found or anything? I don't think so. Hmm. I, I, it looked like all their stuff was gone. Hmm. Uh, so it's this does show up a lot that it's paranormal that they just disappeared like people do at missing 411. Mm-hmm. One thing that is weird, and this I found this in a couple sites, but this is from a blog called Downright Macabre, which I actually really like. I think I've looked at it in the past. Uh, she writes, quote, Strangely enough, the word Croatoan has been found in many other places in history. When the famous horror poet and story writer Edgar Allan Poe was on his deathbed, 
it's said that Croatoan was the last word that he uttered before passing away. The word Croatoan was also found scribbled in the journal of Amelia Earhart after she disappeared in 1937. The word was also found carved into a post on the last bed that horror author Ambrose Beer slept in before he mysteriously disappeared. The notorious stagecoach robber Black Bart carved the word into the cell of his prison before he was released and also reportedly vanished. And the word Croatoan was found written on the final page of the logbook of the ship Carol A. Deering when it crashed into Cape Hatteras in 1921 with no one on board. So that's weird. Is this weird. true? Like the... I think so. Hmm. I mean, I, that's I, really weird. I did that's see true. it on a couple different sites, but I don't, I can't guarantee that it's yeah. true. But if this word did show up where all these people disappeared, that's odd. That is odd. And it is like paranormal. Yeah, a little bit. You know, I can't, I can't vouch for that. I should like maybe... it's such a specific word. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So maybe I should look more into this because it seems very hokey, mm-hmm. you know, that this mysterious word shows up where all these people disappear. It's like the ring. Yeah. Did they <laughs> it's all, like the ring. Yeah. yeah. Like a, like a, you know what I mean? Something that spreads. I'm going to make sure I disappear today and I'll send you like the last text I send you will be the <laughs> word croton. <laughs> <laughs> that would be weird. So I, I can't, I'm not vouching 100% for any of those because I didn't really look into them. Okay. Uh, I know that Poe one, somebody said that one of his last words before he died was Croatoan. Hmm. You know, how true that is, I don't know. It's just so random. Yeah. Another theory, witchcraft. There are two theories involving witchcraft. The Croatoan either executed the colonists as witches or the colonists were the victim of witches who live in the North Carolina woods. The Croatoans believed in witches and witchcraft. Their definition of witches was people who used black magic to commit evil acts in everyday life. While there is no evidence that the Croatoan executed witches or that they accused the people of Roanoke of witchcraft, they were known for condemning dangerous outsiders. They easily could have blamed the people of Roanoke for spreading diseases to which the Croatoans had no immunity. And mm-hmm. I could totally see that yeah, because that is, that is one of the theories coming up is that they were wiped out by disease. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Croatoans and other Native American tribes tell legends of witches who live in the North Carolina woods who use black magic to hurt people. There is a story that the people of Roanoke became the victims of these witches when they left the island and that is why they were never heard from again. Hmm. So I don't, I'm not really buying witches. Yeah. You know, at least witches living in the North Carolina woods that, that killed them or whatever. Right. Another theory, cannibalism slash Wendigo slash miscellaneous weirdness. <laughs> this okay. comes from, this comes <laughs> from the, broad. this comes from the history collection website. It says, quote, in 1609, in the settlement of Jonestown, Virginia, the colony had to resort to cannibalism to stay alive. It's possible that the people of Roanoke had to as well, since their supplies were kind of gone. The settlers could have been hungry enough to see cannibalism as an option. During the investigations into the disappearance of the settlers, local tribes mentioned that there were internal conflicts in Roanoke before everyone disappeared. The people could have resorted to cannibalism because they were hungry and killed themselves off. An outlandish theory, but an interesting one nevertheless. It seems outlandish because they were probably in an area that had plenty of natural resources yes, for yeah, food. Yeah. Native Americans believe in a wild spirit in the form of a beast called the Wendigo, which we have talked about. Mm-hmm. When people resort to eating human flesh, as in the case of cannibalism, their bodies are said to be taken over by a Wendigo. If the people of Roanoke resorted to cannibalism, then, according to this belief, they are still alive, roaming the woods of North Carolina in the form of Wendigos. Hmm. Okay. The Croatoan belief system includes a spirit on the island that has the power to absorb humans into its landscape. If the spirit was offended or angered, it would turn people into trees, animals, stones, or other part of the land. If the colonists were exploiting resources or abusing the land, it's said that they could have angered the spirit. This means the people of Roanoke didn't actually disappear at all. They were just absorbed into the land. The Croatoans also believe in the reptilian devil of the woods, an evil spirit that attaches itself to people. This spirit made people violent, greedy, and paranoid. The Croatoans believe that the reptilian spirit had possessed the settlers once they started to turn on each other after White left for England to retrieve more supplies. Hmm. So there's that. I don't know. 
I mean, I love the idea of paranormal type explanations. Yeah. Just... I just don't think that's, I don't think it's a paranormal type right. explanation. Yeah, no, I don't either. Another theory, they split up and went their own separate ways. That could be true. Yeah, <laughs> it could be. Like, they're dude, like, I don't think he's coming back. <laughs> I mean, how long did they wait? And they're like, right. yeah, I don't think John, I think John ditched us. You know. Yeah, they just moved to some other, what was around at the time that was established. I, I don't know, but they mm. might have just all, like, especially if what people are saying was true, that they were starting to, like, not get along with each other. Yeah. You know, some people might have taken their besties and been like, let's let's ditch this place. They have boats? I mean, it sounded like they were on good terms with the Croatoans, so mm-hmm. maybe the Croatoans helped them. Yeah. Gave them boats. And that's one of the th- reasons why if they were still on good terms with the Croatoans, I'm assuming that they would have given them food or helped them farm. Right. You know? I, the splitting up and going their own separate ways, I could totally see. Totally. Yeah. Another theory. They just settled somewhere else and yep. lived a, a long, happy life. He just never knew where yep. they were. Another theory. The colonists managed to get a boat and perished at sea during a deadly storm trying to return to England. That could totally Or hurricanes happen. and storms just wiped them out. Sure. Sure. Except there were no bodies. Like, people expected there to be... Well, and you would have seen devastation in the land, I yeah. think, if there were a hurricane. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. But I could, if I could they see managed them being to get out a boat, sea. yeah, if they managed to get a boat and tried going back to England and it didn't work and they sunk. I mm-hmm. mean, but then about the why is Croatoans written on the the tree? Uh, yeah, we'll get to that though. Another possibility, like I mentioned, disease. According to the History Collection website, quote, disease is another theory that has much historical basis to support it. The Roanoke colonists could have encountered a New World disease that they had no immunity to fight. The theory goes that the colonists could have caught a good old-fashioned plague that presented with symptoms of delirium, paranoia, or madness. Considering the reports from Native American tribes in the area of internal warfare in the Roanoke colony before everyone disappeared, this does seem like a viable theory. The healthy could have wanted to get rid of those who were sick because they were afraid of getting sick themselves. This easily could have escalated into a violent situation. Once the disease hit, the healthy population could have sectioned off into smaller groups and left the colony, leaving the sick to die. This certainly could explain the multiple sightings of Europeans and local Indian populations in later years after the colony disappeared. The only problem with this theory would be what happened to the bodies of the sick. Mm -hmm. Right. Another theory... They were all killed by Native Americans or the Spanish. From the HowStuffWorks.com article, quote, It's certain that the Spanish in the West Indies were aware of the English colonists' presence. One Roanoke settler named Darby Gland left the 1587 expedition once it set ashore in Puerto Rico to take on supplies. He later reported that he did tell the Spanish officials the location of the Roanoke settlement. Hmm. So the Spanish could have easily gone there and wiped them out. But on the other hand, Governor John White, the first person to discover the colonist's disappearance, reported everything he saw in a letter. There were no bones, like those that had been left behind from the 1585 colony. And you wouldn't you wouldn't imagine that they would have been buried no. if they had been like massacred. Yeah. The houses had been taken down, not destroyed or burned. Before White left, the colonists were instructed to carve a Maltese cross in a tree if they were compelled to leave against their will. The Croatoan carving didn't indicate distress with a Maltese cross. Everything pointed to the settlers just having simply picked up and left. Hmm. Like, they, that was their How code. How many were there? 115? Okay. That was their code. Like, if, if they were in distress and being taken somewhere, they would carve a Maltese cross on a tree. Okay. They carved Croatoan, but no Maltese cross. Hmm. In the opinion of John Hopkins University anthropologist Lee Miller, the colonists were deliberately left at Roanoke by Sir Francis Walsingham, Secretary of State to Queen Elizabeth I, in the hopes that the colony... Were, so, sorry. There were no Croatoans there either? To tell them what... Croatoans were there when they landed. But they weren't there when... I don't know. I don't know. Like the uh, the place was completely empty. Well, we'll get we'll get to that. Okay. Some of that, I think. Uh, the opinion of university anthropologist Lee Miller: the colonists were deliberately left at Roanoke by Sir Francis Walsingham, Secretary of State to Queen Elizabeth I, in the hopes that the colony would not survive in order to bring down Sir Walter Raleigh, a f- Raleigh, a favorite of the Queen, Raleigh, who had funded the expeditions to Roanoke. 
had received a patent to all the land in the New World that he could settle, but he had wanted the last group to settle in the Chesapeake Bay area instead. It's believed that the colonists inadvertently wandered into a violent shift in the balance of power among inland tribes. Indians, with whom the colonists were friendly, lost their hold over the area, and Native Americans hostile to the settlers took control. If the Roanoke colonists made the trip inland when this happened, the men would have likely been killed and the women and children captured and kept as slaves. The colonists would have then been traded along a route that spanned the U.S. coast from present-day Georgia to Virginia. So this is saying... This feels viable to me. This is saying that they purpose they knew the tribe was going to get wiped out but they did that because he wanted he had a beef against sir walter walter raleigh for Mm -hmm. some reason from a history collection article it says quote in 1607 captain john smith tried to uncover what happened at roanoke he claimed that chief powhatan told him that he killed the people of the colony to retaliate against them for living with another tribe that refused to ally with him Allegedly, Powhatan showed Smith items he took from Roanoke to support his story, including a musket barrel and a brass mortar and pestle. Pestle. By 1609, the story reached England, and King James and the Royal Council blamed Powhatan. Powhatan? Powhatan? I don't know how to pronounce that. Blamed Powhatan for the missing colonists. William Strachey seemed to back up the story, confirming the slaughter with his investigation into his work, The History of Travel into Virginia. Powhatan claims that he ordered the killings because there was a prophecy that he would be conquered and overthrown by people from that area. Contemporary historians and anthropologists dispute the story because there were never any bodies or archaeological evidence found to support the claim, but it has persisted for more than 400 years. Recently, author and researcher Brandon Fulham has re-examined Smith and Strakely's resources and has suggested that the Powhatan massacre could have been the 15 settlers left behind from the second expedition, not the third, still leaving the mystery of Roanoke unsolved. Hmm. So this is saying that like this, this Native American chief said that he is the one that slaughtered them either because it sounded like, the, like they were buddies with the Croatoans who would not ally with them, so yeah. they wiped them out, or because there was a prophecy that he was eventually going to get conquered and overthrown by people from that area, so he wanted everybody from yeah. that area gone. But then the other researcher says that he thinks that happened with the second group that was wiped out by the Indians, and not not oh. the not the Roanoke colony group. But the second group wasn't wiped out by the not natives. Not completely, but most of them were. The natives were wiped out. no. Like the natives were the ones that wiped out the, because rem- which well, group was they, it? They weren't wiped out, but there was a lot of fighting because they they caught wind that that group was going to slaughter them, so yeah. they went to slaughter them. But I believe there was a lot more fighting okay. with the groups. I don't know if they were necessarily all slaughtered, mm-hmm. but people were killed. Yeah, you know, in the fighting. So I don't know. To um, me, the 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 fact that Crow Croatones and Crow which is like somebody trying to write Croton yeah. and getting interrupted. Feels or like, like I don't know how to spell this. Feels feels like maybe they were being taken out by that group and instead of a cross they were like I'm going to tell them who did this to us. So they wrote that on a tree. Yeah, but the Crotons wouldn't have taken the Crotons were good with them. Like maybe the Cro- something happened 3 years it's went possible. by. It's possible. I I'll tell you which one that I think is is right and I actually think it's not this one but the one after this one. So this this theory is that everyone died off from famine or disease. Sure. Like famine, like they didn't have supplies. I still think there'd be remains, yes. though. Yeah. And like you said, who'd bury them if they all just, you know. I could see if. Unless the Croatoans were friendly enough with them that they gave them burials. But Also, just, they wouldn't want to live within a bunch of bones and remains laying around. I yeah. think they would bury them yeah. just to not live around Especially that. if they were sick, too. Yeah. You know. So they're dying it off It wouldn't from, have to be from respect. It could be, I don't want to live. Famine because they didn't have food the supplies but i just kind of how big is roanoke the island is not that big so they could potentially run out of resources one of the buried casks from the secret treasure hunt is supposed to be there so i'm kind of familiar with that territory Mm. because i've been looking at that okay but everybody dying off from famine or disease i could kind of see but again where are the bodies yeah this next one is spoiler the one that i really believe 
This theory is that the settlers assimilated into the society of the nearby Croatoans or other local Indian tribes. The How Stuff Works article says, quote, It's also conceivable that the colonists met a less violent fate and went to Croatoan Island, which was 50 miles south of the settlement. The Jamestown colonists sent out several search parties to find members of the lost colony and made a habit of questioning any Native Americans with whom the Jamestown members made contact. Some of these Native Americans told tales of white settlements further down the coast with two-story thatched roof houses, a style unique to the English. Others told of nearby tribes who could read English and dress similar to Europeans. Perhaps the most dramatic report from Jamestown was the sighting of a boy dressed in Native Native American clothing, but having blonde hair and being fair-skinned. Hmm. These reports corroborate the most widely held theory of what became of the colonists. They just assimilated into some friendly Native American tribe. Over the course of generations, intermarriage between the natives and the English would produce a third distinct group, possibly becoming the Lumbee Native American tribe. So that's one of the theories. The Lumbee tribe of, is uh, the Lumbee tribe is native to North Carolina, yet no certain lineage can be pinned down. The tribe's oral history links them to the Roanoke settlers, and this tradition is supported by some of their surnames and the tribe's ability to read and write English. Family names of some of the Roanoke colonists, like Dial, Hyatt, and Taylor, were shared by Lumbee tribe members as early as 1719. Hmm. The settlers who met them were astonished to find Native Americans that had gray eyes and spoke English. Even within the Lumbee tribe, the veracity of the group's link to the Roanoke colonists is in dispute. The Lumbee connection, as it's come to be called, is intriguing. Hmm. And that's that's my... Seems very plausible. Like, yeah, and that's why they Occam's wrote... Razor. That's why they wrote Croton is because they were going to that island. They Could were be. traveling to that island to talk to the Indians to figure out what to do. Mm-hmm. And they just... Stayed. They stayed. Hmm. They just stayed with the Indian tribe. Another interesting one is called Sites X and Y. Analysis of John White's map by the British Museum indicated that a patch on the map at the junction of the Roanoke and Chowan Rivers was covering the symbol of a Renaissance-style fort and to the north the dot indicating a Native American village. It's weird that there was like a hidden thing under a patch on the map. Additional scrutiny of the patch surface revealed a different symbol, perhaps drawn in invisible ink and interpreted as being a fortified town. This led archaeologists from the First Colony Foundation to investigate the area in question called Site X, located in present-day Bertie County, North Carolina, in 2015. Though they only found a couple dozen pottery fragments at the site, ground-penetrating radar revealed another possible location two miles away north of Salmon Creek, dubbed Site Y. The team had begun their excavation of Site Y in December 2019 before the COVID pandemic hit and were able to find many more fragments of ceramic vessels originating in different parts of Europe. Hmm. Some consider this evidence that a small number of the lost colonists settled in the area, but the claim has been disputed by others arguing that there is no way to know if these artifacts were left behind by this group or other colonists of the time. Sure. From the House Stuff Works article, quote, it's possible that a severe drought and subsequent inability to grow crops drove the colony from its original location to sites X and Y. Historians believe that sites X and Y might have been a fallback community of sorts, featuring small numbers of the English settlers, but not the entire colony. This fragmented group may have been quickly integrated into the local native tribes, diluting their English blood and erasing a record of what happened to the original colony. For now, the research continues. In 2019, historians and archaeologists alike were buoyed by the North Carolina Coastal Land Trust, which bought the lands around Site X and Y to save them from being turned into a housing development. That land, that sounds like poltergeist waiting to happen. (laughs) Right. That land is now under state control and will be turned into a natural preserve. Oh, that's better than a subdivision. (laughs) Yes, one where researchers can continue their work without fear that their sites will be bulldozed and converted into housing. So one last interesting thing is something called the Dare Stones. Found in November 1937, a stone inscribed with a letter to John White, supposedly from his daughter Eleanor Dare herself, details what happened to those left behind after White had left for England. 
The story written on the stone claimed that the colonist met with only misery and war for two years shortly after his departure, leading to the death of more than half of the group and leaving just 24 people alive. They moved inland toward the Chowan, Chowan River, where the stone was found, and experienced further hardship when all, including Eleanor's husband and daughter Virginia, except seven, were executed by, quote, savages in 1591. Directions specify the location of a mass grave some four miles east of the river on a small hill and ask that the stone be placed there. 47 other stones were then found by a stonecutter named Bill Eberhardt that continued the group's narrative and moved towards present-day Atlanta, Georgia through 1603. Unusually, these additional stones were stylistically different than the first, piquing the interest of reporter Boyden Sparks, who then exposed them all as fakes in 1941, except the first stone has yet to be proven or disproven as genuine. So why isn't this a viable explanation? I mean, a letter from the daughter. They don't know if it's legit or not on a rock. It was written on a rock saying, Mm. and she said that what happened was that there was only misery and war for two years after John left. Half the group died and they moved inland where more of them were executed by savages, which I'm guessing. Have they been able to date the rock carving? I'm not sure. It's a carving, I'm assuming, or? Yeah. Hmm. And, and it, I feel it, like there's ways said to that, substantiate this. Yeah, it said there was a mass grave four miles east of the river and that they asked for the stone to be placed there with the mass graves. The other 47 stones were found to be fake, but they don't know if this stone was fake or not. Mm-hmm. And like you said, there should be a way to tell. But if it is real, it explains kind of what, what she wrote what happened, but mm-hmm. we don't know if it's real or not. And finally... In 2007, the Lost Colony of Roanoke DNA Project was founded by Roberta Estes using her private DNA testing company to see if the missing colonists did, in fact, merge with local Native American populations using historical records, migration patterns, and oral histories. The project offers DNA tests to people who think they might be descendants of the original people of Roanoke using Y chromosomes, DNA, and mitochondrial DNA to make that determination. So far, DNA testing of Native Americans has not been able to identify any Roanoke descendants. Hmm. So what do you think? I feel like the most reasonable explanation is that they just moved out. Resources became sparse and they just moved to a different location. Do you think they moved in with the Croatoans? Or do you, because why would they have, have. why would they have Croatoan written on the tree? Yeah. Like to me, that was them they didn't know when John Smith was coming back. Mm-hmm. To me, that was them telling him where, they, where went. they went. And I think they went to Croatoan Island, and I really feel like they just mixed in with the tribe and eventually were taken in by the tribe. And well, it sounds part. like there's evidence of that, like the surnames and yeah, the... Yeah, and people seeing like a blonde, mm-hmm. blonde boy... Speaking English, having gray eyes. With Native like... American clothes. Like it yeah. sounds like they were taken in by the Croatoans, and they merged and became this other tribe that were a combination of the colony and the croton mm-hmm. tribe that feels logical to me yeah and that explains why there were no bot like they, they just packed up and left their home because they were going there because they might have not had any food or they were worried about the spanish or the other native american groups attacking them mm-hmm. like they had no idea if he was coming back what happened right. so they didn't know what to do so i feel like that's the most plausible, plausible explanation. explanation or like you said they maybe moved inland more someplace where they could farm and were massacred somewhere else mm-hmm. Ran into a tribe that wasn't friendly. Yeah. So it was interesting because I didn't know any of this. Like no, I didn't either. It, you know, I just don't think there's any paranormal. No, I don't think so either. Nothing weird. It's like, mysterious, yes. It's but mysterious, but I think it's just not because missing we don't know what happened to them. Yeah. But if, if that word Croton was really written in all these places by people that disappeared, that's weird. That's creepy. Mm-hmm. But I'm not really. Unless they all went to their grave thinking, what happened to yeah. the Roanokes? My, uh, my bunk detector is going off on that. that yeah, I think that was bit. kind of embellished. A little hokey. I don't think that's it. So you think, you agree with me. You think yeah, I do. They, either went, they either were assimilated by the Croatoans and became this separate tribe or. They moved inland and just didn't make it, and we just didn't know where they were. Their... Or they moved somewhere else and thrived, and we just he just never found them again. Yeah, but it sucks for him. I feel yeah. bad for him. Yeah. 
you know, whether or not that rock was actually legit that had the, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I feel like somebody could test that very easily. So much of this reminds me of the Curse of Oak Island. Yeah, a lot Just of this like is very... Just like the mystery and like the weird things Island-y. left behind yeah. and yep. yeah. So hopefully this was okay. Like I said, I yeah. feel like I didn't do this real one justice, but it's, so. it's interesting historical. Both stories are historical interesting. Mystery. What time are we looking at? Hour and 49 minutes. Oh, dang. Pretty perfect. Pretty perfect. Oh. Because you have to do song choices. I don't have question. a song. I, don't I do. S- oh, okay. Then good. I'm glad. <laughs> I was actually going to ask you when we got here. Yeah. I'll randomly do song choices over time. Is there anything else? Uh, the question, but do the okay. song choice first. Okay. We'll end with the question because I might have a lot to say for that one. So I, I've been racking my brain and I came <laughs> up with one thing and I don't even know if it's a great answer. But anyway, my song choice is, I, so I recently discovered, I love YouTube. That's how I discover a lot of stuff. It's how I discovered Ren, who was my song choice last time. YouTube like amazes me with that band uh, Spanish love songs. Like Aaron is super into them now and it was suggested to me based off stuff that I listened to and mm-hmm. it's like perfect. So I feel like YouTube just knows me, yeah. you know, it gets me. It's That's creepy. another weird, weird thing is that the phones like people stuff showing up in people's search and news yeah. feeds that they're thinking of that they haven't googled yeah so yeah maybe youtube's reading or our said mind. out loud yeah maybe yeah. youtube's reading our mind so anyway the name of the band is called sleep token have you heard of these no, guys at never all heard of them. they just had a new album come out um i can't think of what it's called i'd have to look the summoning maybe I think they started out because I'm I've heard some of their older stuff and they're not as metal ish. I'm calling them metal ish. Um, they're this band that's anonymous. So when they're on stage and there's not a lot of great videos of them performing live, like it's all fan videos. But like the lead singer goes by the name Vessel, and they all wear masks, so you never see their face. It's kind of like Slipknot. Like they perform without their masks now, like but Guar? kind of like Guar? kind of yeah, but. Oh boy. But not, no, I'm way more musically inclined than Guar, if you ask me. Um, but yeah, they, they wear like robes, they wear black body paint. Like you can't see any discernible characteristics about them, but they're men. You can tell that. Yeah. I think the drummer might go by like the number two, like the Roman numeral two. Like it's that kind of thing. Yeah. So they're totally anonymous. They're from the UK. Um, I'm very particular when it comes to metal. Like the lead singer has to have a good voice like i can't handle screechy growly screamy stuff like it's just not my thing yeah and this guy i love his voice i'm excited to check this out actually yeah the name of the song is called chokehold there's a lot of really great songs um i have a i follow their spotify channel so i get like a big variety of like older stuff and newer stuff but i i really like them a lot so yeah the the band is called sleep token it's kind of dark metal ish and the song is called chokehold so huh. I'll post it in the, the okay. Facebook group. I'm glad group. you had a song because I just didn't think of one. Yeah. I got one stewing up here, but I'll do that next time. It's stewing. It's stewing. Steeping. Good. I'm excited to check this out. Yeah. Like it floors me that, uh, what's the guy's name from Slipknot? I, shoot, what is it? The lead singer? Yeah. Oh, it's right on the tip of my tongue. I can picture him. He has a lot of videos of just him. Yeah, but he's really good. Oh, a, yeah, he has a great voice. Uh, there's a song. Oh, it's going to bother of, me. There's a song I'm thinking of that I think Aaron, t- uh, Corey Taylor. Yes, Corey Taylor. Yeah. That's it. Yes. What's his, his uh, Stone Sour? Like I, I'll never forget Aaron and I. I was parked with Aaron in his car and we were getting ready to go into work one day and he played this song and it was like a poppy, like really pretty slow song and he's like, "You're never going to guess who sings this." And I, I made some guesses and he goes, no, it's it's Stone Sour. That's the singer from Slipknot. And it's such a good song. And I've put it on like mix, when I worked at the factory for some of my friends, we exchange mixed CDs and I put this on there and they're like, oh my God, this is so good. Mm. And then I would tell them who it is. And I'm like, are you serious? So <laughs> yeah. Maybe one of these times I'll do that one. But he's like talented. Yeah, he, he has really a great is. voice. He does have a great voice. Yeah. So I'm excited to check yours out. So our question mm-hmm. that we got, we actually got a couple questions. So I'm glad that people are sending us questions. Sweet. Are we um, only doing one? Yeah, because okay. this one I got. A, I've talked about this situation on I here. I think I have too. But the question, I didn't write it down. I didn't get a chance to write it down. But it was basically somebody wrote in and said, I love your podcast. They said, I'm super into the synchronicity that you guys talk about and seem to pass on to our listeners, which is weird. 
You know? No, it's like when I forget who it is, but whenever somebody says they're checking out Hellier, yeah, this person in the strangers group. I'm sorry, I can't remember specifically who it is. They're like, oh, have the synchronicity yeah, started like up for infection. you yet? It's almost yeah. like an infection. Yeah, but and a it's good weird one. That people that listen to us get get the infection. Yeah, but they wrote that they're really into that, and they said along those lines. And their question was, has there been a little moment in your life that should be insignificant, but that you feel is significant? See, that's funny. I wouldn't call it and insignificant, though, the I, moment that I, I read it. I, I read it before I drove up here this morning. So driving up here, that was all I was thinking of. And then, you know, like I know I've told my story on here, but if you want to... I feel it, like I know what story you're going to tell. I don't know if I you're could going be to. wrong. I could be wrong. I think you're going to be wrong, but you go first. So I, I had two hours to think about this, but it's really hard to think when I'm trying to pay attention to what you're talking <laughs> about. Um, the only thing that comes to my mind and I know I've talked it on here before is the one and only time in my life I've ever seen the Northern lights. And I I say it was kind of a small moment because I was a kid. I was up North. I was at my best friend's house, which is four houses down from where I lived. It was at night. We were outside just playing like we always do. And we looked up and we didn't know what it was. I had never heard of the Northern lights. I'd never seen them before, but the sky, yeah, the sky, I distinctly remember like you see pictures of it. Um, it was like these waving, pulsating, yeah, uh, like green, green, very yeah. green. That's I yep. specifically remember it being very green. And we were just like floored, like, what is this? Like, what's happening? It was like just such a, and it, it happened so quickly. It didn't last very long. I remember by the time I thought to call my mom or my dad to tell them, go outside and look, it was over. So yeah, it, it's it happened very quickly and I wouldn't call it insignificant. I saw the Northern lights for crying out loud in a place that you don't normally see them. Yeah. But it's, that's always stuck with me and I still remember what that looked like and yeah. the wonder I felt around I've, that. I've seen them a couple times and it was either driving to school in green Bay or coming mm. home from school in green Bay, but they're amazing. Yeah. But there's only been a handful of times and I'm not up enough. <laughs> I'm not up to see the Northern mm-hmm. lights. The conditions have to be just right. But that's a moment that felt significant was seeing that. Yeah. I mean, they asked what's an insignificant moment that stuck with you. And it's not insignificant, but yeah. I mean, it's just something that happened a really long it's time ago. That, like, and it was very brief. For granted, like people totally. can see and take for granted. Mm-hmm. That's the only thing I could think of. Well, what did you think I was going to talk about? You, <laughs> I don't know why I thought this, but you talked about one day you were, I think you were waiting for someone to come pick you up and you were sitting in your kitchen oh, and the light was no, shining I was sitting through down the window. My sitting down in my grandma's it was like a very nostalgic foyer. moment yeah, for you going outside yeah waiting for my friends to pick me up and that was just a very in the moment feeling of just being so content in yeah. life but that wasn't what I was going to talk about okay i've mentioned mine on here and it's i know it's it's so weird it's really weird to me because it's not a big moment it's like a dumb moment and i've talked about it on here i'm positive i did but when i was going to college so this had to be 94, because I, I graduated from UWGB, University of Wisconsin-Green Bay in the 95. So I want to say this was 93 or 94. And it sounds so dumb, but we I had classes that sometimes went, you know, like I had days where my class was from like 8 till 9, and then I didn't have class again until like 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And that's mm. when I did all my reading and stuff. One of the classes we had was Victorian literature, and that was, I believe, from 6 p.m. till 9 p.m. at night. And that was the one that I've talked about that I went to drunk so many times <laughs> because we'd all go, a bunch of us English majors would go to the, the Rathskeller, and because if you were 21 at that time, you could get beer in the school cafeteria. Mm. So each of us would buy a pitcher of beer, and we went to that class. And uh, Professor Havens, that is my all-time favorite. Everybody's got a college professor that was like their person. He mm-hmm. was my person. Mm-hmm. He taught that class, and he knew because we David told him. David Giebler, the music yep, yep. professor. He was the yep. English professor. <laughs> Just such a good guy. And I found out like recently that he passed away, and which mm. sucks, but... He knew because we told him, we're like, yeah, we go to the, right. He would just shake his head and we must have smelled like beer, but, <laughs> and I wrote so many good essay tests, tipsy. And we class. all like super chatty in that class. <laughs> I did. I did like so good on my essay tests when I was tipsy. Mm. It just like, like that was a lot of essay tests, like, you know, and the other people in the class always 
talked about in my last paragraph, they always called a Kurt-esque because I could take the biggest piece of trash ever written and make it sound in the last paragraph like one of the best <laughs> pieces of literature ever. Yeah. I was really good at that. But anyway, that class went from 6 p.m. till 9 p.m. And one night, I believe it was that class, it might have been another one or I might have been staying there to work on homework, but I left school like around 9 p.m. 15 or 9 20 at night and i walked out of one of the halls you know one of the buildings at the class i don't remember if it was that class or if i walked because the it, uwgb because it's green bay is freezing they have all underground tunnels that you can get mm. anywhere on the campus nice. underground you don't have to go outside that's cool yeah so it might have been a cold day and i might have went to the building nearest my car but it was 9 15 9 20 9 30 and i was walking out and there was a college age girl that was walking in at the same time. And I walked out and she was coming up and she looked at me and she said, have a good night. And I said, thank you, you too. And it's so stupid, but for some reason, that dumb little moment has mm. always stayed with me. Yeah. And I don't know why, but I find myself thinking of this girl and wondering if she's okay, if she's mm. happy in life. Mm -hmm. And it sounds so weird. Not really. But it's just like this, like it's, this happens every day where I'm sure. walking out of a building and I'm like, have a good day or whatever. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, this weird little moment has always stuck with me. And I find myself thinking about this girl who I don't I have no idea. It was weird that she was walking into the building at like 9:30 at night. Right. But it's weird and I don't understand why, but that is a dumb little moment that has always stayed with me. And part of me thinks that our life, you know, like I don't want to say it's predetermined or predestined, but I feel like our lives go along these paths and that there's certain points in the path where something big could happen. Like maybe was I supposed to end up with this girl? Mm. Like was there a moment where I was like you want to come in and get a coffee? Like, like it feels to me like that was a significant moment and I don't know why. Hmm. You know, was this somebody that I was supposed to have in my life? Right, yeah. You know, because think of moments like Aaron and I both going out to Seven Lakes for pizza that night where he wanted more, he wanted to find out about geocaching. Or think about you hitting the enter button to send that email to yeah. us about wanting to meet with our ghost hunting group to yeah. see if you wanted to join it. Here we are. Like if you hadn't <laughs> done that, think of yeah. how different... Oh my gosh. That, that, that's crazy. That little act of sending that email where you mm -hmm. could have been like, nah, I don't want to do this. Right. You know, like These people you could I, be weirdos, like, man. Like think, think of how it affects like the ripples <sighs> that go out that Butterfly affect our effect. lives from totally. these little moments that, you know, there was just a quote I read and I wish I had wrote it down, but the quote was something along the lines of when you get older, you realize the big moments in your life aren't the big moments. The it's moments. the little moments that lead to the big moments. There's this video you can find. I've seen it on YouTube where a guy takes a jar and fills it up with big rocks and he says to everybody, is this jar full? And everybody's like, yeah, it's full. But then he takes a bunch of small sand yeah. and gravel and, and he's like, life is about... It's all these small moments yeah. that really fill up your yeah. jar. And it is. And yeah. I, I think there's moments in our lives where that happens. And I feel like this moment, this weird, dumb little moment outside the college mm -hmm. where this girl told me to have a good night. Like, I feel like that was a big moment that didn't happen. And I don't know why. But like I said, it's weird because I find myself thinking about her. Mm -hmm. You know, like like these missed connections that should happen but didn't. So yeah. that's just my really weird little story about... This weird little moment in time where I feel like something significant happened, even though it didn't. You know, yeah, so that's, I know what, that's you mean. what I got. That's, that's what I cool. got. I think your response is more what the question was looking for, because that was an insignificant moment that has always stayed with you. I don't know. Like, I don't really know what they were looking for when yeah. they asked that. Hmm. You know, because especially question. tying in with synchronicity. Yeah. You know, but I feel like, I feel like... What's funny is what if she's a listener <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and she's like, oh What's my God, funny Kurt, I think that was that me. I met later in life. Yeah. yeah. It's like, I don't want to go on Craigslist misconnections and be like, hey, uh, remember back in 94 when <laughs> I was walking out of this UWG right. building? Because how many of us in? just say hi but and a have lot, a good uh, night people, to people? Uh, Ren, our, our, yeah. our listener, was like really the last week or two heard me talking about my dream about. Um, uh, what was her name? Remember the girl that told me her name and told me to look oh, yeah, for her? Oh, yeah, 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 that dream, yeah. Um. Oh, my God, I'm drawing a blank on her name right now. Oh, you're never going to find her. Uh, <laughs> no, that was so long ago, but, but um, yeah, sure, she's like, you need to find me when you wake up. 
And she was like looking up this name. She was looking up people with this mm. name. And I'm like, that was so long ago. But again, was that like a moment where something was significant should have happened? Yeah. Like I could have found this girl and I didn't. But I don't know. You know, like, like it's just amazing. Like the whole thing with Aaron at the pizza place at Seven Lakes, if he wouldn't have been there, we wouldn't have, you know, we were friends, but we lost touch. You know, and like I said, I think about you and I. What if we never became friends in the podcast? Like, I've met so many amazing friends through this podcast because yeah. they listen to it. I almost did use the example of me coming to meet you guys at the restaurant for the first time. Because knowing you, because it's like, so you're outside like of my comfort of, yeah, zone. I was just going to say, like, knowing you. That's why Jim came with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're anxious of that stuff, but it's yeah. like, what if, what if you would have been like, no, nah, these guys aren't a fit for me, right? And we never, you know, it's just... I remember clicking with Rhonda, yeah, instantly, yeah. Well, every, everybody clicks with Rhonda yeah. instantly. Rhonda's Rhonda Rhonda's, Rhonda's clickable, yeah, she is. Um, but yeah, it's just like, like it just amazes me how things happen in our life, and that we sometimes don't think about how they happen, yeah, you know what or I mean? how our life would be different, or how our life would be different. Mm -hmm. You know, I think about. When I was, like, right after high school, like, actually going to the phone, and I think I had the phone in my hands, and I'm like, should I call? And I was going to enlist in the Air Force. Oh and my I'm gosh. like, should I do this? Wow. And it's just thinking, it's like, how different would life have been if <laughs> yeah. I made that call, you know? Right. So, it, it, that stuff like that fascinates Maybe me. Maybe you'd but have you, insider information on UFOs. <laughs> yeah, I would. Uh, stuff like that interests me, but if you think about it too much, it gets too mind-boggling yeah. and too massive. To too shoulda, about. woulda, coulda. Yeah. You feel like you're going down the road of regret and you don't want to do yeah. that. But hey, mystery girl, if you remember... <laughs> <laughs> you saying have a good night to Yeah, Kurt saying have Anthony. a good night to some weird guy walking out of <laughs> 9.30, walking out of, I think it was probably Theater Hall or one of the halls. or. But it's just weird. Like She pops in my head all the time and it's frustrating because I don't know why. But there you go. Hmm. Hopefully that was a good answer to your yeah. question, mystery person. I think so. I'll have another one next time. Do you have anything else? Deets. Oh, shoot. I just closed my thing. Deets. <laughs> I feel like we should know them by heart. <laughs> yeah, I don't should. know our P.O. box to save my life, though. You can email us at thestrangesessions at gmail.com. This is the last time I am going to say this. We are on Twitter or X or whatever it's yeah. called now at Strange Let's Session without the final not. S. Yeah, I'm just going to remove that. Krista does a great job on Instagram at The Strange Sessions, and we love you, Instagram listeners. We do. Uh, you can send postcards and snail mail to The Strange Sessions. Ooh, I'm burping up my, <laughs> my kvass. You can send postcards address. and snail mail to The Strange <laughs> Sessions, P.O. Box 434, Manitowoc, Wisconsin, 54221-0434. You can call our lonely phone line like Brad did to yell at me about not <laughs> using his listener. Yeah, if you want to yell at us, you can call the phone line. <laughs> using his listener suggestion um, at 920-443-9602. And you can send listener stories to thestrangesessionsstories at gmail.com. I haven't checked that lately. I probably should. Mm -hmm. I know mm -hmm. we did get a couple stories from, from people that I'm going to read in the next couple episodes. Okay. Um, the next episode will be a stories, like red story. So maybe I'll read a couple there, but I think that's it. Oh, you know what? I do want to mention, because I think if you're not on the strangers page, but you're aware of the fact that we have a book club podcast, oh, yeah. we're changing up the format. Um, we were, we were trying Krista to do picks like 900 page books to read. <laughs> It's my own fault. I literally finished the book that we're recording about today yesterday, and I did a lot of skimming to get there. Let's well, just well put it, it was that like way. the first half was great, oh. and I'm like, this is really yeah, And then the second half, really half came, and it's like, oh my God, is it's this like done? Is this going to end? Mud backwards. Yeah. yeah. So, anyway, so we were trying to do like a monthly episode, and then this book forced us to push that out a little. S starting with the next book, we're doing a quarterly podcast. So, you're going to get four. A year, yeah. <laughs> which just I, I've ha already had a couple people on Facebook say, "Oh, thank goodness, because yeah. I cannot keep up with your reading schedule." Now I can actually participate. So if you haven't been listening because you're just not interested, well, that's fine. We get it. But if you haven't been listening or participating because you can't keep up with the reading schedule, so our next book is going to be the Last House on Needless Street. Yes, and that won't. We were not. We're not going to record that till December. So you got plenty of time. Plenty of time. And then the next book will be the end of quarter one in 2024. So we're going to pick the end of each quarter to give you three months to read a book. 
Also, I, I just ordered four books yesterday, and I'm excited to read them. And I loved your stories where you had all pretty oh, music playing. Isn't that a pretty book? I'm pretty so excited. Book. Yeah. I'm finishing Practical Magic right now, but then I'm going to tackle that book next, I think. So anyway, if you if you didn't want to participate because you couldn't keep up, I think hopefully you can now. So yep. just keep that in mind. Should be good. I hope so. Is that it? That's it. Is it time to slide sideways to the side sessions? A couple inches to the left. And this one was by you guys because everybody I'm was, excited for everybody this one. was so puzzled when I talked <gasps> about supper clubs. Supper clubs, yeah. Which is apparently a Wisconsin thing. What the thing. heck is a supper club? Yeah, so this the side sessions is all about <laughs> yeah. Wisconsin. It's not stuff. an actual club. <laughs> it's not an actual club. It's all about Wisconsin stuff. Yep, I'm so excited. I think that is it for this episode. What time yeah. are we looking at? Uh two hours and nine minutes. Dang, well I'm gonna need to go in and edit some stuff because I was so Stumble bum Sinister over words today. Driver of the stumble bus. I was a driver of the stumble <laughs> bus today. So thank you guys so much for listening. We love you and we will be back in two weeks. Yep. So until then, until next time, stay, stay strange. strange.